Vocal people. We're gonna start the meeting because we have a bunch of, um, we have several guests here, and um, we should get started. We're really glad that you're here, and um, we'd like to hear from you. So go ahead, and um, these are. Do you guys want to introduce yourselves? We have. I'm Paul Fastler from Bronson. Melody. Carol Irons from Albany. And Eugene Earth from Swamp. Carol from Greenham from Orange. Uh, Jess Robinson. Um, I'm the administrative helper here on the commission. I'm the state archaeologist with the Division for Historic Preservation. And we're Brad Burlington, Sydney County. Welcome. Fred Wiseman, Swanton. Philip Fred, also from Burlington. I'm John Moody from uh, Sharon. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for having us. Um, my name is Monica Hutt, and I'm actually the commissioner of the Department of Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living. And um, I'm going to introduce you. Angela Smith Jang, and I work in the Department of Disabilities, Aging, and living, I oversee our state unit on aging, our older Americans Act work. Okay, so, um, so we're here actually today because one of the jobs of the department, and, and the acronym for the department is DALE, just to um, keep saying it all the way out loud, but um, one of DALE's um, roles is to support the programs around aging in the state of Vermont. So we have programs that support kind of really high-end needs. Um, it's a program called Choices for Care. Um, but, but more relevant to this conversation, um, we are the administrators for the Older Americans Act, which is a federal act in, in national. Obviously, Vermont has its portion of the Older Americans Act, and that requires us to support individuals, and I didn't make the age range, so don't kill the messenger, 60 and older fall under the Older Americans Act. And, and there's a range of programs and supports and services that we are responsible to provide. Um, and one of the things that we realized is we were putting together um, the next state plan on aging, which is due in 2019, was that we never really had a conversation um, with this commission and with the tribes here in Vermont just to talk about the issues around aging. And if there is anything distinct and different that we should be paying attention to that we just haven't really even thought about up till now. So we wanted to just come and, and open up the conversation, make sure that you knew who we were, talk to you a little bit, and Angela can do it about the state unit on aging and the state plan, and then um, really just hear from you. You know, are there things that we haven't thought about um, when we think about aging and staying healthy and staying in your own home um, and accessing the supports that you need to maintain kind of health and well-being long into your adulthood and beyond. Um, is there anything specific um, culturally to to um, to Abnaki and to the, there's more than one tribe in Vermont, right? I always want to make sure that I'm careful about that. To the tribes here in Vermont that we just haven't thought about, that we should be paying attention to in a different way. So we just wanted to kind of open it up and, and just see what we've been missing, because I suspect a little bit, if not a lot. Well, I used to work for the Ages on Aging in the Northeast Kingdom. Oh, okay. And then I also worked with a mental health clinic as an elder care clinician. <laughs> um, I know that they, they long ago, when Marie Barton was there, she had wanted to do a project with Native elders, but my experience, and I'm, an, I'm a Native elder, myself, my experience was that they did not so identify any time anyone from an agency or state came. There's a, there's a long shadow from yeah. eugenics, and that was still operative. Yeah. I don't know if it's as dynamic now, because it's just about really another generation of elders now. But um, that was a strong factor. And I know that um, because I declined to help with any special project in the Northeast Kingdom because of that, from my own uh, casework population and knowledge of the culture, they did try a project out of the Swanton, um, St. Albans area. Do you remember so, how long ago, Carol, do you think? It, roughly? Around 2000. Give or take a year or two either way, but yeah. it was somewhere around there, I think. 
So whether whether the St. Albans office has any record of whether they actually got something off the ground and did it or not, I really don't know. Because I, I then was shifting the job to the mental health clinic. But yeah. I did, I'm in that population now. And I don't find people as reluctant to self-identify. But they certainly wrote down. So um, that would be the biggest hang up is not identifying that ethnic identity. Yeah. If they're going to go to those offices and seek any any of the programs, which a lot of them do, yeah. mm -hmm. they just give their identity as white. Yeah, and I don't know, even know that we necessarily, I don't mean to just jump right in, but I don't know that we necessarily need people to self-identify. I think it's more we need to build the cultural competence so that we are just offering things and people take advantage of it as they so wish, not necessarily targeting. We could do that if you thought that made sense. I think, I think the problem was, was in terms of some funding streams. If they were serving a higher population of culturally uh, identified people, they could get some extra funding. Right. But that requires identification. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, because Vermont, um, because we don't have federally recognized tribes, it's there's already a little bit of a Ringer, yeah. kind of. We just don't get, you know, we don't, we don't get um, resources in that stream, You're right? Okay. Um, but I'm Angela saying that maybe through a, a, the minority stream. But again, I think we can get there. But I think we have to build if we need to, if we want to. I think we have to build again, just that kind of cultural confidence to start with and see what we might be missing and what we can offer just more universally, not necessarily worry about the. Right, but, but what I found was people, elders with some serious health complications, were very resistant to going to clinics because they were afraid to be identified. I, I, like I said, I'm not sure that's operative now, but it certainly was 10, 12, 15 years ago. I think that you're still going to find that that is the case with many people. Um, like even visiting the um, Burlington Health and Rehab, it was, there was a few of our elders who were there that were, it was the first time in their life who they'd come out and just said, I'm an Abenaki person. And I very distinctly remember the woman sitting next to him saying, you shouldn't say that out loud. It's wow. pretty dangerous to say that. And I was like, hmm, interesting. The first time you say it and someone immediately tells you not to. Um, so I, I, and that was like two years ago. So I think oh. you're still going to find that that is the case with the older generation. But people are changing a little bit because we are all changing. So there are four state recognized bands, but there aren't just four, four bands. So there are some unrecognized bands as well. Um, and I know Masiskoi has this really great um, model. What's going on today, actually? Voices Against Violence is attending a cultural competency two-day training at our office. Part of what they asked for, and this was a good fit for, was what is it that is specific to your members or, you have to remember, Swanton Village and Swanton Town make up approximately, oh, 6,000 people, yeah. plus or minus. And on our tribal roles, the ones we know of that have actually come forward and said, hey, I'm you know, a member of the Missisquai Abnaki, is nearly at 3,000. I would estimate there's probably another 20, 25% that aren't even on our tribal roles. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I think that would be safe to offer to your agency is this two-day training where, you know, if nothing, I mean, at, at the most, what you would have to lose is you know two days of listening to us drone on about what it is like to be you know a member of the tribe and or a person of that culture in this population. So, I mean, if at any time you want to explore that further, just reach out to me and I'm sure I can uh, at least point you towards the folks that would be able to take care of that for you. Eugene is the chief of Mrs. Clay. Okay. okay. Um, and the, one of the things that they're doing there is the um, cultural center is in the basement with the, um, the elderly home there, so. In Swanton. In Swanton. And so they, um, I know that Brenda was very active in trying to make sure that that model was still used because they do like elder dinners and they have the kids go up and, 
And in terms of culturally speaking, that's what we should be doing, and it would be the older folks who are taking care of them, and also who's passing on culture, who has all of the information. So our elders are um, absolutely essential to us. And so they have a model there for that reason. So Brenda Gagne, who does the um, Abenaki um, outreach program through Title VII in Union, is it Title Seven? Yeah. yeah. Um, so they have that model for a reason, and she can probably talk more about it, but she's a really good resource. So Melody, is it the cultural center is in the basement of the senior center in Swan? It's um, at the old school. What yeah, is it? It's an old high school. It's been turned into a senior housing center. Senior yeah. Housing. yeah, it's a really great place. And in terms of one of the things we haven't talked about is um, disabilities. I think you'll find um, so indigenous people have like the highest rate per capita of signing up for the armed forces. And so our warriors are very important and um, I think you'll find that in terms of disabilities and um, that, that is a, that is a, there's a connection there. There's some intersectionalities that should be looked at. Um, and then also in terms of disabilities, if you look at um, who we typically see as um, our medicine people, or people who um, are really integral, that have been touched in a different way by the creator. And so where one culture might see a disability, we don't. Um, and they are essential to our community. And so when you look at, um, like, I know when I was growing up at Mrs. Goy, our the medicine person there um, probably is considered on state assistance. Is that right, Fred? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, Burton. And Burton. Yeah. Um, so, but for us, he's an essential member of our community, and he wouldn't be ever considered as having a disability for us. Um, so we we do look at it in a very different way. Does anybody else have anything else to add? You touched on it a little bit with that community and somehow building, if there's a, I don't know, if you're programming with a one-on-one -on -one trusting, with some, way, some way of building trusting relationships, having the bases of the service people that are engaging with the population be native peoples so that there can be a level of trust um, so that and it's definitely more of that community offering alternative programming if there are substance abuse, mental health issues, like Melody was saying, it's not necessarily viewed the same way. Um, so that there's a different way of looking at those supports. I'm not saying it well. You said it very well for what I'm, for the thoughts in my head versus, yeah. Oh, and Lucy Cannondale, she's the former chair here, and she is a citizen of the Nohegan Band, and she works with the veterans. Um, yeah, um, she at the hospital. The VA. The V. Yeah. yeah. The, she works with the VA, <laughs> and she helps people cross that are indigenous, and she does ceremonies for them, and so um, she's a good contact, and she is also a nurse and an all-around awesome person, so um, she's a good good contact for that. And I'm trying to think of I was also else. thinking of um, if there are definite places where there's more concentration of Native elders, we w that would be helpful for us to know too because we can work with our network partners like the Agencies on Aging and others to try to do some of that work around having the, the right kind of training and the building of relationships and, um, So, um, if, yeah, if it's con if the communities are concentrated in any way, or is it really spread out? Like those are questions I just have to better understand um, how we can be supportive. Um, the state unit on aging, overseeing the Older Americans Act, it has a really broad kind of. Sorry, I'm just. Can okay. you get what he wants to say so that you can say it once they're done? Um, a really broad. Well, you should mention your work as a red robe other stuff that you've done, but it still is a Native American way. 
I have, I have been trained in the Red Road for Recovery um, uh, model uh, for substance abuse, with, and I have used it with Native American elders mm -hmm. here in Chittenden County. Sorry, go ahead. No, it's great. Um, um, so our work is really broad in that we're looking at the whole population and trying to ensure that we can support older Vermonters to age well um, and, and prevent a lot of need for higher levels of care. Um, and so the Older Americans Act programs are really trying to help people age in place, age at home, be as independent as long as possible. So it includes services like nutrition supports, home delivered meals or congregate meals, transportation support, um, a lot of um, in-home supports like uh, case management, um, personal care, adult day, those kinds of things. Um, and then health promotion, disease prevention is another part of it. So helping people stay active through evidence-based programming to prevent falls, um, to uh, manage chronic disease, those kinds of things, as well as caregiver, family caregiver support. As we see our population aging, we're also seeing a growing number of Vermonters who are family caregivers. And so it's support with um, respite, education, training, peer support, that kind of thing for family caregivers as well. Um, and so our primary partners in community in the work of the Older Americans Act are our five area agencies on aging that cover the state. And their role is to kind of act as that regional planner um, for, the, for their multiple county area in providing the services on the ground. Um, so we're kind of coordinating at the state level, and they are really um, supposed to have their eyes and ears in the various communities um, and coordinating out those, those supports and services, working with the network of, of providers. Um, so it's, it's a big body of work, and it all kind of culminates in a state plan on aging, as Monica mentioned. So we're working on developing our next four-year state plan on aging. Um, which, you know, we look at data, we look at trends, we look at where, you know, the key areas where we really need to see some improvement. So, for example, um, we have a goal around falls prevention because Vermont has a really high rate of um, falls and injuries and deaths due to falls across our, across the older population. So really looking at um, ways we can expand programming and options and awareness around that. Um, that's just one example of, of, the, of the goals within the state plan. What else should I say? I mean, I think that one yeah. of the things that is, is different for us right now and that Angela and I have really tried to take on is that um, when people think about aging, certainly in the state of Vermont and probably nationally as well, there's this um, sort of fearful, anxiety-ridden approach to it versus people sort of understanding it as part of this very natural life cycle and how amazing it is to to get older and to know what you know and to have all that experience to share back and trying to change a little bit of the frame because people tend to approach it as this time when people are needy and bedridden and, and weaker or less able, less contributory. And there couldn't be anything further from the truth, especially in the state of Vermont. You know, we have one of the highest volunteer rates in the country, and most of those volunteers are older Vermonters. When you think about civic engagement, community engagement, it's mostly our older Vermonters that are, are doing that work. And so really trying to change the dynamic and the conversation. So yes, they're in any population, at any age, there are going to be kind of high-end needs. Um, and as a society, we need to take care of those needs. And there is all of this richness that older um, Vermonters bring to the table. And I don't, we don't want communities to sort of forget that and to pigeonhole the conversation into um, what their needs are. It's really more, what do they bring back to the community? And so trying to kind of flip that, that thinking a little bit is a huge part of the work that we're doing now. At the same time that we have to maintain all those services and support. So yeah, those exist. 
and there's this whole conversation. And so um, trying to get the governor really on board with thinking about older Vermonters, you know, as he talks about the workforce issues, we say, you know, you've got this whole group of older Vermonters who who either don't want to be done working or can't yet be done working. I mean, let's be honest. Um, and that's a whole workforce that we need to pay attention to. So having him really um, get behind this award that we created that really honors businesses that have policies that support older workers, you know, more flexible policies, better retirement programs, um, you know, the ability to telecommute, you know, all the kinds of things that make it easier to work and allow individuals to keep contributing back. So trying to kind of flip the conversation a little bit is a big part, is actually the biggest part of what we're trying to do in addition to, I think, everything else and, and, and framing everything like that versus everybody talking about getting older like it's this terrible thing because, you know, the news flashes that as soon as you're born, that starts. So if you're gonna pretend that that's not happening, you simply kind of put blinders on and aren't paying attention to your own body and to what's happening. So I think trying to, to make that change has been um, big for us. Well, of course, I don't think that corresponds right. well with our culture. Exactly. Though, because right. Because the elders right. are honored. And right. And we've, you know, I think that, um, so, so my family is, are immigrants, and so we have a really different approach to that in my own family. And so kind of bumping up against what's a little bit more typical has been, is interesting. You know, it just sort of changes the dynamic altogether. And and, um, and I think that culturally we are so fearful of this that we aren't really approaching it with the kind of joy and opportunities that really should be a part of it. Um, and, and I think that then we create these really elaborate structures to take care of people um, that separates from community. And so trying to really imagine communities um, that are inclusive, and that works as well for the disability work that we do in the department. Um, you know, how do you how do you get people to really um, understand how much richer an experience is when it is inclusive of everybody? So I think it does really correspond well to to more native values and culture, typically. And I think you'll find so there's a there's a bunch of programs like the Mohegans have. Um, uh, fuel assistance, and they'll actually go to different elders' homes, and they'll, um, you know, bring firewood, and they'll stack it, or they'll help them do whatever. Right. So there's there's a whole bunch of things that are happening um, that we're already doing, but doing for our own folks. And so yeah. one of the other things that you could look at is um, for us making sure that our elders that can't make it to ceremonies can get to ceremonies. So if there is a program where they can be transported. I know my, my grandmother, um, she, uh, there was an Abenaki, an Abenaki gentleman who used to come and pick them up um, and they would bring them to like Doris Minkler's house and they would, they would do ceremony there <laughs> and like it was kind of cool. But it was actually bringing them to, making sure that they could do sweat lodges or they could do whatever they wanted to, to do to take part in the community. Um, I think that would be kind of a cool, um, a cool cultural piece is that making sure it's like going to church. Yeah. You know, well, it is going to church. It's our church. But yes. there you go. So, okay. And, okay, so you have 45 minutes. If we take the last five minutes there for public. Well, I was just going to add something to this conversation. Yeah. Um, so there's a woman named Margaret Higgins who works for the state. Uh, she's an evaluator. She's down at uh, Central Vermont Hospital right now. They're doing their annual survey of the uh, Woodbridge uh, Center uh, mm -hmm. we have in, in nursing home. And I was just visiting an Abenaki elder who just fell three days ago, broke her hip, and on and on. So it was interesting talking with Margaret because, you know, she's there evaluating this facility. Everybody was incredible. It's, it's great. But I think you'll find that Margaret is Abenaki, and, and, and there are hundreds of Abenaki people we know of who are in the professional services taking care of people. And much like the veteran analogy, that there are more veterans per capita in Vermont who are Abenaki or Native, that's also true in the healthcare uh, world. That um, at least down where we are, White River Junction, DHMC, a quarter of the people who work there are Indians. So now they might be. You know, in the in the working staff cooking the food, they might be nurses, they might be doctors. I mean, they, they come and you know, and all of that is a vital part of how things get done in Vermont. But it is extraordinarily understated. Calvin Coolidge, whose room we're in, is 
grandmother was Abenaki and Mohican. Nobody knew about it until after it got done because she couldn't be in the President of the United States back in those days. But there's a, a tremendous amount of potential. And if you're in touch with Margaret, I'm sure you'll be able to find her. She should be able to really guide you through the state system and what's going on for Native people because she's been doing it for 40 years. Much less, much less. And there's um, a, a lot of these facilities, like if you go to Dartmouth, um, they have opportunities, say you're um, going in for surgery or something, but they'll have smudge rooms. So make sure that they can, they can take part in the ceremony before they go in, which well, is Dartmouth normally not allowed. smudge anywhere as long as you do it without setting up the Yes. <laughs> yes. So you can in the morgue. So is UVM. Yes, you can, like you can do it. It's case by case, but case you know, we've done it many times. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. right, do you want In fact, to... curves, actually curves all of the hospital, every hospital in the state of Vermont have participated in those kinds of gatherings. So, you know, so I'm just going to leave you all with this. You know, it also has, um, so it just has the basic overview mm -hmm. of the OAH and the work that we do. Thank you. Have my contact information on it. So. I can't find these people on there. <laughs> if you want the contact, so one of the things you could do is you could, I don't know if you have lists or anything that you maintain or newsletters or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, the Each of the four chiefs, it would be good to keep them on your lists because then if you want to reach out, like um, Don Stevens is probably our most like active chief that goes out and does a lot of just about everything, but all of the chiefs, if they can be included, um, they can get any information you want out, or they can be set up like a focus group or something that you, if whatever you need, then I would say reach out to the, the four chiefs. And so they're in terms of being spread out because of some of the questions yeah. you had. Um, Missisquoi is super concentrated <laughs> up in the northwest corner around uh, Franklin County. And then Nolhegan is pretty concentrated around the Northeast Kingdom, but they still have members all over, just like all of us do. El New is based in um, Jamaica, Vermont, and everybody is all over the place, and there's only about 100 people in it. So, um, yeah. And then um, Co-Os. The Co-Os. They're in, based in around Pike, New, New Hampshire, Woodsville, New Hampshire, somewhere there. And um, the Orange County area is um, part of part of their area, maybe. I don't know. Somewhere in there, middle we're, Vermont. We're around where Blue Mountain School is. That. <laughs> yes. So, um, and if you need to, um, if you want any other contacts, I can get them to you. Okay. Which may no longer be in existence after this year. Yeah. So, any last questions? updates on the Abenaki Cultural Regeneration Project? Just a little bit. We're tentatively planning um, the last weekend of August for a two-day or uh, day and a half because then people have to take the road. But uh, we're going to try to, it's not real firm yet, but we're trying to get a hold of a, an, an herbalist who will just, we'll use the kitchen there and just teach people how to make um, tinctures, oils, and salves. You know, use the herbs or preserve them so that as you're gathering, you can go on with is, that. Is this for the people that had already taken part in the? Primarily, at least, yeah. But if, if someone else is interested, uh, up to a point, I think we could accommodate because it isn't requiring the previous involvement. Do you want? How do you want to get that out, the word, if you're? Well, I want to line up the teachers first, and then okay. maybe Carol can send it out email to you guys. Okay. To all of you, if that would work, and then you can spread okay. it. We would send the info to the tribal chiefs. Okay. What's the limit on participants? Mm -hmm. What's the limit on participants? Because we'd be staying overnight, um, we can have up to 16. So we're going to have a couple of teachers. I imagine we could take 12 to 15. Cool. Let's talk about the Swanton Monument Road right now. Okay. I just thought we should wait. Yeah, no, that's fine. So 
Um, we got a call from um, the Robertsons and Sue Co We actually got a call from Highgate Town Office, who had been alerted from by Mr. Robertson and Mrs. Coda at the end of Monument Road, near the monument, that something was going on with the land there. They saw a bunch of rises. We subsequently went up, and um, on the portion of the land just down the road, back towards Highgate, um, away from the monument, going for some 125 feet, there's a major crack in the soil that's appeared. Uh, and it's pulling away from the bank and um, also lowering. We uh, immediately snapped into action, called um, Disaster, uh, I forget their acronym, but but uh, Vermont Disaster FEMA. Recovery. Not that we called FEMA, absolutely, yeah. but our, our local counterparts as well. Um, the Rivers person from uh, the environmental um, uh, environmental group here at the state all went up and evaluated it. And it's big. It it's, hasn't fallen into the river yet, but it is a big area of slope, massive slope failure, about uh, 125 feet long, up to about 15 feet back. Um, and it is, while there's been no archaeological excavations formal ever in that particular portion, it's sandwiched between two known burial sites. So we have every reason to believe that there could be some about Native American remains in that area. We have pulled out all the stops. We're talking to FEMA. We're trying to get that event, which we think was precipitated on a May 4th to 5th flooding slash wind event, which caused the trees to pull over, caused the roots to uproot, and then the whole land start to slide. Um, but we've been going through various processes and it's still ongoing right now. Even if we did get the FEMA funding, that's a reimbursement. So we, as the state, have to come up with a large chunk of money. There's, we've had several consultants go out and try to give us um, you know, estimates. They're high. Um, it's the only portion of, of the area that hasn't been rip-wrapped. And part of that is because we really only found out when we did a detailed deed dive but after you, if you, you've been out to, I think all of you have been out to the monument, there's some stone sort of, you know, set off stones. After that, there's actually a 50 foot right of way that the Robinsons own. Then we own 50 feet. Then there's another person that owns 50 feet. And then it goes back to us for two lots. And so because it's this private state conglomeration that the crack cuts across, it's very, it's becoming, very difficult to figure out what FEMA will, what FEMA won't cover, will they cover any of it? Because this is the only event that's being listed in Franklin County. The, uh, the storm event was originally only for Addison and Chittenden. We're also searching other avenues, but um, we had a meeting with our assistant secretary yesterday. So we're, we're turning over every stone to try to get it done. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, we're running headlong into various bureaucracies and everything. I, I don't think anyone's unwilling, but it's, it's what to do. And at this point, because it's so profoundly disturbed, there's some people think there's nothing we can do. Even if we riprap it, it's going to slide. What does that anyway. mean? Hmm? What does that mean? Riprap, it's where you take big, big, like boulders, angular boulders, and put them along the bank. Mm -hmm. So if you've ever gone up, like, or armoring the bank, basically. Okay. And we've done that with most of the state-owned portion going from the monument out to Dead Creek. Um, we did that a portion in 91 and a portion in 94. Uh, but because we bought this interim parcel afterward as part of a larger you know, easement that the land trust bought that gave to us as you know, part of um, a native site and potential burial protection, we just didn't rip wrap that little 50 thing because we couldn't get the permission from the private landowners. Now they're all very much involved. They, they obviously don't want to lose this portion of their yards either, um, but it, it's, it's tricky. If it was just private, they could leverage 
various grants. If it was just state, there's less, but it was possible. But anyway, it's a, it's, I just wanted to assure everyone we are doing over and above everything. And I, I've got to give you know, um, a lot of credit to Scott Dillon, who spent a lot of nights and weekends and um, everything trying to draft letters, you know, just do the rounds on phone calls, trying to do something. But, you know, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bad time for this, too, because of the state budgets and everything's already locked down. There's no chance for someone to write in a last minute thing. And so, you know, that's where we're at. They've asked us to, um, last night they sent me an email and asked us to draft a letter from the commission, um, talking about the importance of the site to FEMA, FEMA, so that they could get funding. And Pete Thomas did that, right? Yeah. yeah. Pete so, Thomas is the, actually the FEMA archaeologist. And yeah. So, yeah. He's epic. I love that guy. Yeah. So um, I started drafting it, so if anybody wants to help drafting it, or draft it, and it might behoove the Missisquoi people to draft their own letter and send it by tomorrow morning. By tomorrow morning? Yes. And uh, we have to do this tonight. He wants me to draft it now with you and then bring it over there, and I don't even know where over there is. So what we're going to do is we're going to draft it, <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm going to scan it and send it to them in an email. But we just have to draft some language about why it's important and um, yeah, from the indigenous perspective, but from the commission, yeah. A while ago, there was a big email thread that was going throughout all kinds of, uh, all the different Abenaki uh, bands and uh, discussing the potential of getting a cultural center going. And so what I did is I uh, took a document that years ago, Melody, me, and uh, a student of mine who is in historic preservation, Julie Sink, did uh, with a uh, support, as you can see, of uh, the 2010 quadricentennial. Uh, the idea was that uh, one of the outcomes of the quadricentennial was to be a Fran Franco Vermont or French Canadian uh, heritage center and a indigenous Vermont heritage center. And uh, there was a group of us in the um, quadricenta, the Native American quad group that were tasked with trying to develop a, uh, a vision for what that looked like. Part of that was going around and talking to, um, I think scores anyway, if not, not hundreds, but certainly scores of indigenous people asking them um, what their thoughts, ideas, and beliefs were. And that uh, generated a document which I reported on uh, in 2011 to you guys, so it should be in your archives someplace. Uh, but after this new flurry of activity, I got back and well, a bunch of us in this email thread started trading ideas back and forth and back and forth. Um, and it emerged very quickly that the idea that we had had early of a brick and mortar um, Euro-American style uh, museum, museum. Uh, was probably not going to fly for a whole series of reasons, one of which was uh, upfront cost, and the second was uh, uh, maintenance, uh, who would be able to keep the lights on, pay the taxes. Uh, the idea was, would we be able to afford to have a full-time person there, even at a pittance pay? And uh, the consensus <coughs> of most people was that um, unless we got a big grant, uh, we wouldn't be able to get this thing, and B, if we had to come up with some kind of an endowment, we wouldn't be able to, uh, to staff it and pay for it in the future. So with that, uh, I'm, I wrote this uh, as a rewriting of the original document with the input from all of the other contributors to that, uh, the big email discussion chain. Um, so the idea of it is uh, there's some needs assessment here. The basic need that we had uh, back in those days was political. Uh, in other words, it's got to be in a neutral place. No particular tribe can own it. 
uh, it's got to be have a ceremonial component. In other words, a place for all tribes uh, to come together to do intertribal uh, activities. It has to have community memory. This was uh, important. Mem Melody, I think this was one of your ideas, wasn't it? Too? Uh, because the Passamaquoddies and other tribes and all their centers, they have a community members, um, a community memory, kind of a, um, a module where they have pictures and other commemorations of, uh, of important elders and others who have passed. Um, like at the Smithsonian, with the elders wall? Yeah. yeah. And like what we saw up in Passamaquoddy. Yeah. A long time ago, with all the baskets and everything set up as families. Lots of interesting uh, prototypes there. Uh, number four was one that the chiefs uh, seem to have a, uh, an interest in. And actually, that same concern led to the thing I reported to you on uh, in January, uh, cultural education. The idea that Rick Holshaw, uh, really interestingly, uh, Rich, excuse me, uh, is called essential, essentialist uh, Wabanaki or Abenaki training. Uh, in other words, what do we know historically, culturally, uh, that is local to our region, as opposed to all of the external memories uh, that are coming in from the Great Lakes, powwow, spirituality, and things of that sort. And so one of the ideas of a cultural center would be, in Rick's, uh, Rich's words, essentialist. In other words, it would give a, a potential for all the different bands to contribute their uh, historical and cultural knowledge that is place-based here uh, that can then be made available to everybody. Now then there's economic development, stuff like that. Uh, so these were the needs that were uh, expressed years ago and kind of reaffirmed, at least some of them, in the uh, early 2018 email flurries. So um, what we had began discussing was kind of decolonizing this idea of a cultural center. In other words, getting away from a brick and mortar kind of a thing. And um, so what uh, some of us uh, came up, and uh, Rich was very important in that melody, and others uh, contributing to this, the idea of a place rather uh, than a space. Uh, start building from an environment uh, a place that could first be just an area to have ceremony. Uh, you don't need buildings, you don't need anything. Then think about expanding into, uh, if we've got a forest, to alter the forest, build an agroforest that could be used as a, as a uh, potential medicine woods uh, to have uh, areas where you could raise crops. All of this is minimalist infrastructure, uh, inexpensive, and in a sense, when you actually look at the essentialist Vermont data, we have little on ceremony, but in terms of land use, land tenure, um, and things like that, we have a huge amount. That's, if you remember our petitions, we're, most, not, uh, we're mostly based on land tenure, land use, uh, place-based um, cultural things. And so this will kind of, not mimic it, but uh, track that uh, essential idea. And then, uh, so I deal with landscapes and uh, all these other components. So uh, Melody said that uh, last month you brought up the idea uh, here of that. So I typed this up and brought it to, forward it to you. This is a result of, you know, many years. I've, I've you know, it's been, I don't think that building a, a heritage center is as difficult as people um, you know, people say. For example, back in 1997, uh, just me and my wife, in $1,800, we built the Abenaki Cultural Center uh, at Missisquoi that was up and running and functioning for over 12 years until internal stuff blew that and a bunch of other things uh, out of the water. Um, and so, you know, it was three and a half months. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of new paint and stuff like that. So it can be done. Uh, if this thing is, we actually do get a, a space that is decent enough to house ancestral 
uh, you know, essentialist Abenaki things, that I would be, I still haven't donated all of my stuff. Yeah, I still have probably about 3,000 objects and, and certainly another 12,000 uh, images that could go into an archive here. So, uh, but I have donated quite a few things to the Historical Society, Echo and the Maritime Museum. Uh, a bunch of other things have gone to the Passamaquoddies, a lot of my Wabanaki things I'm sending back to the tribes that they, you know, that they originally were produced by. But we could outfit a nice, nice place. So that's, that's what I wanted to bring, is just share this history with you to see what, you know, where you'd like to go with it. And our last um, point is Blessing of the Fields. That was great. That would be you. <laughs> that was great. Um, it actually brought some folks together. That did, does everybody know what they did for Blessing of the Fields? Huh? Only Can you? Facebook Thank goodness for Facebook. Ten steps back. Ten steps back would be. What was it? What did you do? Well, what you learn? I'm going to go like. Who was 11, there? I'm going to go 11 steps back. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, in trying to uh, work with uh, Fred Wiseman in reference to things that we wanted to do or bring back, uh, it's a process um, because we had, for a while, had leadership that was not interested, quite frankly, and that's putting it gently. Uh, people would just exclude the Missisquoi tribe from a great many things because there was no participation or no willingness to participate. Uh, first thing that I mean I wanted to do was change that. So, in, in speaking with Fred, said, like, "What what can we do?" And uh, he is a, a great, you know, incredible repository of knowledge and things that we've done. And we we sat down and we said, "All right, uh, let's you know." Crystal kind of coined the phrase, bring your native back. And that's what we decided to make our, uh, our campaign slogan. Uh, so it was a trend of what can we do? And then we kind of looked at the calendar and said, okay, in the Etna IP calendar, what can we do that would be, you know, in, in correlation with that? Long story short, uh, incredibly generous, uh, he decided to give up his time every month to do an, an event, whether it was talking uh, at the tribal office or giving a, uh, a, an event like a class or something. Well, anyway, he brought up the uh, blessing of the seeds or blessing of the field. And he told us up front, this is going to take some dedication. Do you think we can do it? And, you know, the hope spring is eternal. So we're like, yeah, yeah. So we started off with a meeting and we had like 24, 25 people. And we said, here's what's happening. If we want to do this, it's going to be here. It'll be at this time. You're going to have to learn this. We have to make this. And the, the training was event-driven. It wasn't a come on by and learn a, a song or uh, make regalia just you know for the sheer cause of doing it. It was, we have this event. I will teach you what you need to know for that event, which was great because you knew what you were doing was going to be used. So uh, he came in and uh, Don Stevens attended one of them and we started with some singing and you know we did uh, gosh maybe uh, a month later we did a little dancing but it was getting people together. So the 24 eventually dwindled down to 11 but it was what we needed for that event. And we went to the Intervale, which I had never been to before. I had heard of it, but never had been there. And we practiced our skills. We made some uh, needed items. Uh, some regalia was made. It was amazing to see. We had somebody drop off a couple of bulk materials, like the tea dresses were made out of this. I uh, like curtain material or something. It was like, like yeah, but it was. There's a full skein of it or something it was huge. I'm like, oh, why would somebody drop this at our office? We managed, and I say we, Allie was like amazing. She's this little wind up robot, like the Energizer Bunny, that if you, I swear she's OCD, because if you put her on task, she will just laser focus on this, and she must be held to live with. 
because she will just turn herself into that. She's event. getting married this fall, too. Yeah, I, I haven't talked to him. But so, anyhow, uh, we took the stuff, she made some wonderful dresses, and then, uh, you know, Fred's wife helped, and uh, we showed up and we made uh, sun discs and stuff out of feathers, and it was a great time. It got people together. And all the while, you were still learning a skill. So, uh, we attended the interview, which, like I said, was my first time going. We met a bunch of people there. It was, uh, uh, we conducted some interviews, and it was fun. And you're still conducting a ritual that was very old, and that was powerful. And the most amazing thing was at the, the end of it, we're standing around, and somebody's looking up, and I, I don't remember who, but they're like, oh, what kind of bird is that? And it was like a huge osprey. And it didn't just make a fly by and go, it kind of hung out for a while. And so every Eight circuits. Yeah, that, I mean, it was impressive to see this, you know, at the end of your ceremony, you look up and there's this huge bird of prey just circling around. It was a beautiful bird. I mean, on a gorgeous day, we got lucky, lucky, lucky. I mean, a knock on fake wood <laughs> or not. We had just the greatest weather and stuff for this event. But it was, Powerful enough to me as an individual that when we discussed would we do another event, it's like, yeah, absolutely. Because it, maybe it'll bring in 25 more people. We might only end up with 11. But guess what? That's 11 people we didn't have with these skills before. So, um, and the public was very receptive. I mean, they were jumping up there, bringing their seeds over to be blessed. And at the end, people were talking and asking questions. It was, I feel it was a, a great event that was worthwhile, and I would wholeheartedly support doing as many different events and reoccurring events as possible. I have some people of the school systems that are doing the seats and renewal stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I told them to contact you for their for blessing of the fields. And some of the kids I know that go to the schoolhouse mm -hmm. are, um, there's a Passamaquoddy student and there is a few Abenaki students. So I think it would be nice because the kids, there's a couple kids there who would really love it, so. Yeah, and yeah. anything that we can do to attract these kids yeah. is, I mean, personally, that's one of my goals is uh, kind of mending fences as well as bringing these younger folks in because that is the future. And, I mean, we can sit there and say, oh, that's great. But until you actually do something about it, it's, it doesn't mean, I mean, you can put stuff on paper, you can talk about it all day, but until you put it into practice, it's just talk. Yeah. So, yeah, anything people can direct our way, if there's any way you can get young folks involved. Cool. Awesome. Well done. No, I think uh, Fred for his teachings and participation, and Morgan Lamphere is one of our tribal council members that he is a music teacher by trade. Uh, he appears to be busier than a one-armed paper hanger, and he would make time to come up uh, for a while. It was each week, and then it became like every other week or something to, to work on these songs. And so being a teacher, you kind of knew how to sit down and take people that knew nothing about how to do something like this and say, well, here, this is what we're going to do. We're going to break it into this. But yeah, I, I, he, he deserves recognition for his part. So he did very well. Yeah, that's great. And what I would, what I'd like to add to this is, in terms of the you know the epistemological or the knowledge base that's behind it, um, I I shifted what I do a little bit after my January uh, talk that I gave here because I got some very negative feedback from several people about the thing that I was going to the uh, harvest ceremony. Uh, in other words, where where do you get this? Where do you you know? How does he know uh, this? Where does it come from? Is it Abenaki? Is it just made up? So what I'm going to do from now on is each one of the things that I do is going to have a complete uh, document associated with uh, with complete uh, citations uh, to each part of it and where they come, documenting and that's on the documentary and bibliographic notes. So that there will never be any question about uh, is this ethnogenesis or is this uh, essentialist? Okay. So every dance, every song, 
every part of the organization is based on uh, unknown Wabanaki, uh, and in some cases, Abenaki, and some from Odenak, a little bit, about 6% to maybe 10% is Eastern, Eastern Abenaki and Passamaquoddy. Um, the organization is based on the protocols of the Wampum Laws of the Confederate, Wabanaki Confederacy to which the Abenakis belonged. And uh, I don't think anybody will argue with the law. Uh, that's that's our, our way of doing it. So that was the organization. And each individual component uh, is documented and all the material, um, all, all the music and everything is on file and, uh, and available. And, uh, so I just want to be absolutely clear uh, that uh, from now on, everything that we're going to go moving forward is going to be essentialist. In other words, there's, there's not going to be any uh, thing from outside of the realm of the Wabanaki area in any of the projects that I'm doing with Missisquoi. And there can't be, you know, I mean, everybody for political reasons is going to grouse about it. But in terms of uh, you know, the documentary uh, and spiritual, whatever you want to call it, origins, and provenance of everything is is documented.